Okay, for the first socialization theory I would like to present, I would like to show to you BEM's exotic becomes erotic theory. So um, just to give you context, BEM is himself gay, and he was trying to generate a socialized explanation for how a person would become attracted to their same sex or to the other sex. So his theory is attempting to explain both sides. So first off, he acknowledges that biological variables probably drive sexual orientation at the very heart, right? Like that, um, you know, there are, we have certain brain structures and things that are designed to attract us towards whichever sex we're attracted towards. And that probably our hormones and other kinds of factors play a role in that. Um, he, but what he adds into this is the idea that biological variables contribute to our natural temperaments. So temperaments are like precursors to personality traits. So you might have a, as a child, you might've had a difficult temperament, for example, like maybe, um, you got upset or easily, or, um, you know, if you missed your nap, then it was like impossible for you to eat dinner. And then you couldn't go to sleep when it was bedtime because now you're so overtired. Like that's a difficult temperament. And some children have easy temperaments and, and, um, some children are like slow to warm up. They have a temperature temperament that makes them slow to warm up. So they're like very shy initially, but once they've warmed up and so like these are precursors to personality traits. And so he thought biology helps to set up these basic temperaments that ultimately could lead to personality traits. Um, but he wanted to emphasize that childhood temperaments lead to um, engaging in sex typical behavior or sex atypical behavior. Um, so he thought that very much at the heart of our preferred activities when we're little was this biology dri driving our temperaments that then drove us towards certain behaviors right? Like that we have this innate attraction to, um, you know, playing with trucks or playing with dolls or liking to run and climb and, and, you know, make a lot of noise or liking to be quiet and play with puzzles. You know, that he said that it's something sort of very inherent in us, probably biologically driven. Engaging in sex, sex typical or atypical behaviors, though, can lead us to feeling different from our opposite sex pairs or peers or our same sex peers. So if a person is engaging in sex typical behavior, it makes us feel different from the opposite sex and makes us feel the same as same sex peers, right? If you're engaging in same in sex typical behavior, you think, oh, I'm like these people who share my sex and I'm unlike these people who don't share my sex. On the other hand, if you engage in atypical behaviors, um, it makes you feel like your opposite sex peers and makes you feel different from your same sex peers. So it's a um, base. So this innate preference that he thought was due to biological variables filtered through our temperaments leads to this first part that's really socializing, which is where we're looking around into our social milieu and we're saying, um, you know, what are the other people who are, whose sex matches mine doing? And do I feel like I'm doing the same things or the opposite things? Um, what are the people who don't share my sex doing? Am I doing the same things or the opposite things? And so he says that's the first step where we start to really internalize whether we're doing um, things like our same sex or like the other sex. Okay, now this one part's a bit of a leap, so you're just going to have to bear with it. Um, over time, this doesn't happen immediately. This flow chart kind of gives you the impression that, oh, and then as soon as you make this recognition that you're feeling different from your same sex peers, then you automatically are going to be physiologically aroused by the opposite sex peers. That's, he doesn't mean it quite happens like that. He meant it more like throughout childhood, as you're engaging in your sex typical or sex atypical behaviors and feeling different from your opposite or your same sex peers, you're internalizing information about, you know, which group you fit in with, which group you spend your time with, which group seems like very knowable and familiar and which group is seeming very unknowable and very unfamiliar. So that by the time you're starting to get a little older and pushing towards adolescence, you start to actually feel physiologically aroused. It could be at first fear. Um, it could then start to become maybe sexual arousal ultimately towards the peers who are different from you, right? So if you're feeling different from the your opposite sex peers, you will start to feel physi physiologically aroused by your opposite sex peers. So you'll look out into the environment and you'll say, wow, those people who are the other sex from me, 
they do everything differently from me. They're so different and unusual and kind of scary, kind of interesting. Oh, kind of attractive, you know, like this slow progression. Or if you feel different from your same sex peers, then you would look out and say, gosh, those people who share my sex, they do everything differently than I do. They're so intriguing and different. And I'm scared of them initially slash now I'm starting to be, you know, other kinds of physiological arousal, including sexual arousal. So it's a long process, he says. Ultimately, that physiological arousal will morph into an erotic attraction to whichever sex is different from you um, behaviorally and who you have been experiencing this physiological arousal to. Ultimately, it will evolve into erotic attraction. So that you can see where he came up with his term, exotic becomes erotic. So um, he thought that your natural tendencies drive you towards behaviors that then cause you to start internalized socializing issues, right? You internalize the idea that, oh, no, I'm doing something different from the people who are like me, or I'm doing something different from those opposite sex people. Um, and then it leads you into this physiological arousal that usually begins with fear. If you think about in childhood, a lot of times, you know, the kids say that the other sex has cooties or whatever. Um, and so that kind of physiological arousal might be directed towards the opposite sex peers, if that's who you feel different from, or towards the same sex peers, if that's who you feel different from. And then that morphs into erotic attraction. Now, one of the things that Bem argued is that, you know, he had four older sisters. Oh, wait, that falls into our biology, our genetic um, thing that we were talking about in the last discussion. But um, so he had four older sisters. And so he argues that being raised around all these girls made them not exotic to him at all. <laughs> and so he thought that given that he already liked to engage in sex atypical behavior anyway, and um, because he was surrounded by, you know, these opposite sex people who weren't very mysterious to him, that it was his same sex who became more exotic to him. And so it then morphed into eroticism and like that. So he acknowledges biology at the base, but he then thinks that there's a sort of, um, you know, context driven component to sexual attraction. Um, now to look data-based ways, um, let's look at what research has shown us about what he's claiming basically. Um, so this is from a study that was published in 2000, um, and it's looking at, so you see on the bottom, it's looking at sexual orientation as one possible outcome. It's looking at childhood gender nonconformity as another possible outcome. And then it's looking at another, a measure of continuous gender identity as another outcome. And at the top, we have factors that flow into those outcomes. So we have genes as one exp explainer. We have shared environment. So that would be in the household, things that siblings both experienced as a function of being raised in the same household. And then we have non-shared environment, which would be the things that happen outside the household, like in class at school or away at sleepaway camp that only one of the siblings went to and somebody else didn't, you know, those kinds of things. So they, of course, had to name them A, G, C, G, and E, G. Um, and then they all flow into this big G, which then has these outcomes. So um, what I wanted to draw your attention to is um, the big G is representing phenotype. Now, the word phenotype um, is used to describe observable outcomes of the genes that are inside of you. Right. So for example, some of you have a phenotype of brown eyes and some of you have a phenotype of blue eyes. Among those of you who have a phenotype of brown eyes, your genes might be mixed. You might have one brown eyed gene and one light colored gene, blue or green or gray or something else. But your phenotype is brown. Right. So what we're looking at here is the idea that there may be genes that are mixed in an individual that might produce an outcome that only looks like one outcome, even though it might be mixed genes that fed into it, right? Um, and it's acknowledging that genes are not enough in most of these kinds of measures, right, to explain the outcomes. We saw that with the identical twins. You can share 100% of your genes in common and not have the same phenotype with regard to sexual orientation. Um, so it's trying, this model is trying to take into account the socialization component, the shared environment and the non-shared environment. Okay, so if we look at the person's phenotype, 
we see, um, I tried to outline this in blue to indicate that the top row is referring to the correlation coefficients for males. Um, for those of you guys who have not had the pleasure of going through stats yet, correlation coefficients can run from zero to one and they can be positive or negative. It happens to be the case that everything on this graph is all positive. So that means that um, they're positively correlated, it means they one goes up, the other one goes up. They are directly related to each other. So the numbers can be between zero and one. The closer you are to one, the more strongly related the, the variables are thought to be. So in the males, you can see that the most strongly related factor is actually the non-shared environment and the phenotype. Um, genes only account for about um, 0.5, so it's only about 25% of the variance between people is accounted for by genes. It's a little different for females who are highlighted in pink to distinguish. So um, what you see is that females, genes and non-shared environments seem to both be the important factors in determining their phenotype. Um, you'll notice that shared environment is zero for both males and females. And one of the reasons for that is when we're looking at the contributions of things, um, we have to be able to separate out, well, what role do genes play? What role does shared environment play? And it's really hard to separate those two things from each other because usually the people who gave us our genes are the same people who provided the shared environment, right? So their parenting of us may have been a function of their own genes, which then they passed on to us. So it's not surprising to see that zero correlation between shared environment and the phenotype because everything's being explained by either genes or the non-shared environment. All right, so let's move down here to the things we're interested in, which are sexual orientation, childhood gender nonconformity, and then continuous gender identity. Um, so you'll notice that for boys, for, for the men in the sample, sexual orientation is thought to be um, mostly genetic. So you see that that A is the key thing there. Um, it's got a 0.56 correlation between genes and sexual orientation. Again, the shared environment is at zero. And then uh, the non-shared environment is a 0.23 correlation. So it's smaller. You know, the 0.23 is not a big number, but it's coming out significant. That's what that little asterisk means. Um, gender, childhood gender nonconformity looks like it's, again, mostly going to be genetic as far as our explanation our power to explain. And then the other part that would contribute would be the non-shared environment. And then in the continuous gender identity, you see a flip-flop where it looks like um, non-shared environment is the most important factor in determining gender identity. And uh, genes is are, are large. That's a big correlation coefficient, but less important than the environment, the non-shared environment. For women, the pattern's a little bit different. Sexual orientation, notice that genes are at zero. And then the shared environment and the non-shared environment are, they're providing all the explanatory power. And then after that, you see that the um, patterns are more similar a little bit. You see with gender, childhood gender nonconformity, um, it looks like non-shared environment is more important for females. Shared, um, genes is more important for males. So it's a little bit of a flip-flop, but, um, you know, we both have the non-shared, I'm, I'm sorry, the shared environment not really contributing on the childhood gender nonconformity. And then when we get over to gen continuous gender identity, nothing seems to matter except for the non-shared environment for females. Genes doesn't play a role and shared environment doesn't play a role as far as this data goes. So this kind of makes an argument for certain aspects of sexual orientation and um, at least gender, childhood gender nonconformity to be attributable to um, both genes and environment for males um, and then only environment for females on the sexual orientation. So a little bit of support for BEM's interpretation and a little bit of mixed result for, for BEM's um, interpretation. Well, let's go to the granddaddy of all the socialization explanations, and that would be Freud. You know, Sigmund Freud has this model, and we're going to go through this model in great detail when we get to, uh, you know, the, the uh, development across childhood and adolescence. So I'm not going to talk about anything except for what I've um, highlighted in yellow right now, and we'll come back to this model later. Um, Freud said that during the phallic stages, when we develop our um, gender identity, which he thought then contributed to our sexual orientation. Um, he didn't call it sexual orientation, though. You'll notice in this table on the far right, he calls it sexual dysfunction um, and deviancy. So he was really interested in um, 
how a child comes to acknowledge that they are male or female and therefore they should be attracted to males or females. Um, let's see if I've got, yeah. So let's talk about what happens during the, the, uh, phallic stage. Um, something called the Oedipus conflict occurs. <laughs> so if you've had the pleasure of reading Oedipus Rex or seeing the movie Oedipus the King or anything like that, um, when I was a high school senior, my AP English teacher made us read it, watch it as a movie and act out the play ourselves. So I don't know what that was about. But after I get done explaining Freud's model, you're going to think, hmm, that is weird. <laughs> um, maybe you had an AP teacher who did the same thing. I don't know. But so Freud's basic idea is that um, little boys around the age of three and continuing until they're about six fall in love with their moms, want to marry them, and little girls fall in love with their dads and want to marry them. And it's all very cute. And you actually see this in children um, where they seem to really favor the opposite sex parent during this period. Um, So they are in love with their opposite sex parent. Now, Freud didn't say fall in love. (laughs) No, because he's Freud. So he said the child falls in lust with their opposite sex parent. They want them for themselves. They want to marry them. And the only way that they can see for how they could have their opposite sex parent to themselves is to get rid of their same sex parent. So if we are talking about a little boy, he falls in love with mom and he sees dad as a competitor. So he tries to figure out a way to eliminate dad. Daughter falls in love with dad, needs to eliminate mom. Okay, this is where it gets a little messed up, though. I've been doing this nice balance, male, female, mom, dad, little boy, little girl. But look at what Freud thinks is the solution to this um, lustful feeling for the opposite sex parent. He thinks that as the little child is thinking, how can I eliminate my same sex parent? Hmm, Let's see if I attack him in his sleep, if I try and beat him up. Um, you know, how can I get rid of him? The little child realizes that the parent is going to be very angry when they find out that the child has been hatching this murderous plot to get rid of the same sex parent. And so according to Freud, the worst thing that a child can imagine is being castrated. He didn't mean castrated like we do to farm animals. He meant like literally penis, testicles, everything's gone. Now, a little secret about Freudian theory, he thinks that little girls, when they look down and see that they don't have a penis, when they're about three years old, it's not that they look down and go, oh, look, I have female genitalia. They look down instead and they say, oh my gosh, someone must have castrated me. (laughs) I'm sorry. I was going to try and say that with a straight face, but I can't do it. Um, So a little girl looks down and says, I must have done something really bad because someone has castrated me. So one of the problems with Freud's whole model here is that little girls think that they've already been castrated. So there's nothing to develop anxiety about, whereas little boys, they still have their penis. And so they could, I guess, at least follow Freud's model and develop castration anxiety, a fear that dad's going to figure out that son is trying to off him. And so dad would retaliate by castrating son. So castration anxiety is supposed to be the motivation that causes the child to repress their lust for their opposite sex parent and repress the aggression they've been feeling towards their same sex parent. And ultimately, they're supposed to identify with their same sex parent. They're supposed to say to themselves, all unconsciously, of course, um, well, obviously, I can't kill my same sex parent, so I'm never going to have my opposite sex parent to myself. So you know what, I'll just be as much like my same sex parent as I can be so that someday I can attract someone like my opposite sex parent. Because obviously my same sex parent has all the qualities that it would take to attract a mate like the one you know, that I'm in love with. So the development of the, that identification with the same sex parent is a really critical factor. Now I'm going to fix our flow chart here because we've got to take the daughter out of there, don't we? Because she has nothing to fear. She's already been castrated. So I'm just going to talk about what happens to boys because clearly we're just going to have to ignore the whole thing happening with girls. I mean, it just, it can't follow the way that Freud said. Let's talk about boys. So he's in love with his mom, wants to kill his dad. Okay. What if mom is really domineering or as Freud called her henpecking? 
flattering term for, you know, a nag. So if she's really domineering and dad's passive, or what if dad's not even there and son is being raised by a single mom? That's when Freud says that the child in either of these cases, whether the dad is absent or he's just passive, the boy will identify with his mom as his goal of what he wants to be like. Again, Freud has a, I think he has a problem with this model because why, why would the fact that mom is domineering make a boy say, well, I want to be like mom when it's still the case that if mom's all that great and mom is worthy of all of his lust and attention, dad was the one who was able to attract her, right? I'm like, Freud, there is something wrong with your model. But this is Freud's premise that um, if dad is absent or if dad is passive and mom is the only one there or mom is domineering, the little boy will identify with the mom, not only with her behaviors, but also with her, her sexual preferences. So this is how, according to Freud, a, per, a boy could become gay. Now, because this whole model really doesn't work for girls in any way, because they don't have castration anxiety, um, it's not surprising to know that Freud doesn't really have a model for how women could ever become lesbians. He really doesn't have, it's not included in his model. I don't think he even considered it. But for boys, he said this is how, what he called sexual devi deviancy would occur. He called it deviant behavior, but what he meant is um, homosexual attraction. Okay, so I reported the whole thing. I did my due diligence, but I have to say there's really not a lot to support Freud's theory. And I, when I say no scientific evidence, I mean like no data that points to any of this going on. Like I can give you anecdotal stories that imply certain things uh, about Freud's model might be accurate, but there's no scientific evidence to support the idea that a domineering mom and an absent or passive dad is what causes a boy to become gay. There's, there is no evidence to support that. Now I'm going to show you a model. This is not data. This is a model that was introduced in 1982 that pointed at people who maybe have a homophobic ideas of their own and maybe might be gay, right? So they, they think it's really, really wrong or bad, but they might be gay. Um, you can kind of map that out onto Freud's theory and talk about how, you know, your superego, which is your, um, your conscience, it's the part of your personality that tells you you should never have any fun or do anything that, you, that it just feels good. You should always do the right thing, the moral thing. Um, so if you're carrying around with you internalized homophobic content, yet you feel attracted to people of your same sex, your superego is going to cause you to feel really guilty. It's going to make you do a lot of self-deprecating, putting down yourself kinds of thoughts or behaviors, self-destructive behaviors. Um, the ego is the part of your personality that's supposed to balance the demands of the superego that always wants you to be good and, and nice and the demands of the id that wants you to do whatever feels good, right? The ego has to figure out a way to balance those demands. So it's in charge of you trying to figure out who you are, formulating your identity. It's in charge of determining how you feel about yourself, you know, what your self-esteem is. And it's also in charge of invoking defense mechanisms that would allow you to uh, maybe ignore some things about yourself that would be threatening otherwise. So when we talk about, um, you know, if the, if the superego doesn't like the things that we might want to do, our ego is going to, um, you know, invoke defense mechanisms so that we can pretend like we don't have those instincts. And we'll talk a little bit about homophobia in another lecture. Um, and that's thought to, to come out of, of some defense mechanisms, but it might lower self-esteem. It might interfere with healthy identity formation so that the person really has a lot of difficulty sort of seeing themselves as a whole person, a valuable person, um, things like that. Now, this is his model. There's really no scientific evidence to support this either, um, directly as he's described it. Um, there's some evidence not having to do with necessarily homosexuality, but um, Herrick and his colleagues in, 19, in 2009 um, did find that if a person carries with them self-stigma, 
where they internalize the idea that there's something about them that is not desirable or, or um, that if other people knew about it, they wouldn't like them or something like that. That is associated with psychological distress. So it's possible that, um, you know, Malin's model might be a special case of this overall self-stigma idea. The thing about Malin's model is that it does kind of help to support the, um, you know, interpretation that sometimes people who um, maybe have some uh, um, homosexual leanings, maybe they're uh, a four or five or maybe even a six on Kinsey's scale, might be the ones who are the most likely to say there's something wrong with homosexuality or, or things like that, that they're, you know, in denial, that's a defense mechanism. Um, or they can't accept that part of themselves, our identity won't absorb that into them. And so they try and deny its existence or, or put it down or develop a reaction formation about it where they say, Oh, I don't feel like that at all. And they really overreact in denying it. Um, so, I mean, some of it kind of makes sense, but I just have to emphasize there really is no scientific evidence to support this. All right. Well, that's enough on our attempt to make it a socialized explanation. In fact, I'm just going to finish up on socialization saying that you'll notice that we have models, but we don't really have, and here's the data, and here's a graph that shows you what the researchers found that specifically support what this person's saying. We don't have a lot of that. We don't have any of that. I search all the time looking to see if anybody's developed any of these socialization theories with actual empirical evidence, and I, I never find any. So um the thing I want you to walk away with is that there are models that attempt to explain these things, um, but they're but they are not what we call scientifically supported. They might be theories, but they are not. Um, they have not been put through hypothesis testing yet. Okay, so in the next segment, we'll come back and we'll talk about how people ultimately recognize their own sexual orientation and um, you know the process that goes along with that. <laughs> 